well. Uh, this morning, we're reading in Luke 9, 51 to 62. I like to use my Bible. We, have, we always have the scriptures up here, but I like to have uh, my Bible. Uh, and so, and, 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 and if people, a lot of pastors say, you know, grab your smartphones too. You can do that if, that's, if that works for you. But I, don't, I prefer a Bible, uh, the, the physical copy. It's not a right or wrong, uh, you know, you're bad if you don't or whatever, but it's good to be able to see the context, and you miss that on your smartphone, uh, and you miss it, you know, up here, too. Uh, we put it up here for your convenience, but I would encourage you, uh, to, if you don't bring a Bible, to start bringing a Bible, because it's just great to see what happened before the story, and what happened after, what's coming up, you know, you kind of see it all in its context. It's really important. I try and give you a little bit of that, but a little of that when I start the message, but it's a great thing. Plus, if you, I always, you know, if I use the same Bible, and if I forget something, I might not remember the reference, but I kind of kind of remember the location of it on the page, and I can find it uh, even just by that way. So I encourage you, bring a physical Bible. There's nothing wrong if you don't, uh, not, no, no judgment, uh, but I just encourage you, it's helpful uh, to do that. Now let's uh, stand. We're going to do the, like the Malawans today, uh, because... We're going to read the, the whole passage. It's shorter today. Sometimes I, I break it up, and so it's kind of hard to stand for the reading of Scripture. But let's, let's stand for Luke 9, 51 to 62. It says, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him. Because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? So he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, follow me. And he said, Lord, uh, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury the dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I'll follow you, Lord. But first, let me uh, say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. That your promise is not return void. And I pray this morning, as, the, as your word goes out, that it changes us, that it grips us, that, it, that uh, we know from your spirit what we need to change or do or appreciate. Uh, in, our, in our lives uh, more. May we leave this place different than when we came. In Jesus' name, amen. So we see here in the first part of the text, Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. It's a, a Jewish expression that uh, it, setting your face towards Jerusalem, setting your face towards something, means that uh, you are purposefully, intentionally going after something, even though there may be danger or difficulty involved. And Jesus set his face. He was fixed on this purpose of Jerusalem. We've just seen that in, the, in the last few weeks that he had this purpose explained to him. Whether he knew it before or not, we're not sure. This might have been new information, but that what the role of the Son of Man is going to be is not to establish an earthly kingdom, but a heavenly kingdom. And it's going to involve you going to the cross. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, we talked about Moses and Elijah were explaining his exodus, or talking to him about his exodus, probably preparing him for the suffering that he was going to go through. And that, in that background, in that context, then, it says, as the days were approaching for his ascension, talking about after he dies, raises from the dead, goes and appears 
to over 500 people alive from the dead, then he ascends into heaven. So the day is approaching for his ascension. He was determined. He was resolute. He set his face towards Jerusalem. Now, it takes him a while to get to Jerusalem. And this, we, this is the beginning of what a lot of uh, theologians call the travel narrative. It's Jesus traveling to Jerusalem. And in Luke, it's ten chapters long. And he doesn't go immediately from there. If we see the, the, the map here, you've got Israel, Galilee is the, in the north, the yellow region. That's where Jesus spent most of his ministry. So everything so far has been up in Galilee. And then he's going to travel here through Samaria on his way down to Jerusalem in the orange. Samaria is the blue region. The Samaritans, as many of you know, don't like the Jews. Uh, they're half-breeds. They were, they were, historically, they, they mixed with people that weren't Jewish. And so they, they, they were a religious thing. They were not um, pure, pure, purely religiously Jewish Right? And there were a lot of problems that went on in Samaria as they turned to other gods and things. And so there was this tension, strong tension, hatred toward, between the Samaritans and the Jews. They looked down at each other, they hated each other. And Jesus is going to travel through Samaria. A lot of times he would go around, but he was going to, he was going to go through Samaria. But in the, in the next ten chapters, he doesn't go directly there. So he's, he's resolutely setting his face towards Jerusalem, but that's more, a little bit more of a thematic. His purpose now, he knows, is to die. And these next ten chapters, he's traveling to Jerusalem, but he kind of spends a lot of time in Samaria and still up towards in Galilee, in that region. He's not just beelining it for Jerusalem. But mentally, that's his goal. He's heading on his way to die. And he knew, as I talked to the kids, he knew what he was going there to do. And he still went there. And the first point is that Jesus faced Jerusalem for you. Most of us would run if we knew that that's where our destiny was to die. Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. Let that sink in. Just how much Jesus loves you. He loves you that much. He willingly went to die for you. Nothing was going to stop him. Nothing was going to deter him. He was resolute. That's where I'm going. You need saving. And he was the only one who could do it. That was the only plan that would work. That would provide salvation for you. And so he set his face toward Jerusalem. Now, the Samaritans, on the way, you know, he sends out some people, the uh, disciples ahead of him to go and prepare the way. Because he's got a multitude coming, all right? There's a lot of people following Jesus. And so they go into the villages ahead of Jesus and say, hey, Jesus is coming. There's a lot of people with him. You know, maybe they were going to say, you know, will any of you open up your homes to them? You know, some kind of preparations were made. So it wasn't like a shock when this whole big multitude comes into their village, right? And so they're going and preparing the way for Jesus on his way, and in one of the villages, they didn't receive him. They said, no, 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 we don't want him here. And when Jesus had sent out the 12, remember, if, if, if they weren't received, there wasn't a place of peace there. They're supposed to shake the dust off their feet, right? And say, so this town, you, you, you're, you're losing out, you know, it's kind of, not a curse, but you're not getting the gospel. You're not getting the good news. We're shaking the, our dust off of his feet. I'm, I'm shaking the, 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 the dust of our shoes off of and I can't, whatever. And so he, uh, that was their, their M.O., what Jesus told them to do. And in this case, because they rejected Jesus, they didn't want him, James and John, they say, hey, Jesus, you want us to bring some fire down on them? We could, we could burn this village, right? We could pray, and we could bring fire from heaven down and destroy them all. Now, where did this thought come from? Let's destroy this village with fire from heaven. I mean, I think it's impressive that they thought they could do that, and, and they, 
they probably could have done that if Jesus, well, they could have done it if Jesus wanted them to. But why? Why are they thinking this way? Well, in 2 Kings chapter 1, the king of Samaria uh, <laughs> sent out a messenger. He, he got, he slipped and, and, he, and he fell. He was bedridden and he was wondering when he was going to get well or if he was going to get well. And so he sent messengers to the, to the prophets of Baal, or Baalzebub. And Elijah, the, the, the prophet of Israel, found out that and he intercepted these messengers and said, you know, you go back to the king. He's not supposed to go and talk to Baal, but why would he turn to a false god rather than come to the true God? And so he went back to the king of Samaria. The messengers came back to the king of Samaria and, uh, and the king said, why are you here? And he said, well, we were stopped by this guy to describe him to me. And they described him and his, the, you know, Elijah's dress with his camel skin stuff, his fur and, and such, and, and le uh, rope belt, and the king says, ah, it's Elijah, right? So, he, so, so the king doesn't fear Elijah and the God of Israel. He sends a captain of 50 men and says, go, and you go and get Elijah and tell him to come down. And not uh, respectfully, not because he wants to hear from Elijah, and so this captain and this 50 come, you can read the story in 2 Kings chapter 1 if you want. Uh, the, 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 this captain comes with this 50, and Elijah does not come down. He calls fire down from heaven and burns them all up. So what does the king of Samaria do? Sends another captain of 50. You guys go, and you go to, to Elijah. And they go, and Elijah <laughs> doesn't come down. He sends fire down from heaven and consumes them. King of Samaria still doesn't get the hint. And he sends out a third captain of 50 with his 50. And this captain gets it because he falls down at the, at, at, at the, the, the mountain and he, and he says, Elijah, please, I know you killed the other guys, don't kill me. And he, was, he humbled himself before Elijah. And Elijah had mercy on him and he came down and, uh, and worked with him. So there's a precedent set. Samaritans went against God, Elijah the prophet, who Jesus was looked at as kind of the new Elijah, burned them down. So, you know, they're looking back at the Old Testament, say, hey, wants to do like Elijah? And that's what the prophets of old, a lot of them did. They stood up for themselves. They weren't standing up for themselves. They were standing up for the God that they represented, right? Because if they went against the God, if they went against them, they were going against the God that they represented. So it wasn't about Elijah. He wasn't trying to protect himself. Elijah did the same kind of thing. There were a couple of kids, uh, young men, that were making fun of Elisha for being bald. And Elisha summoned a bear, and the bear mauled these two young guys. It's good to be a prophet. Sometimes, uh, no, when people make fun of your hair. But... The prophets, you know, they could do this kind of thing, and, and, and the disciples were looking at Jesus as just one of those prophets. It's like, stand up for yourself, Jesus. You know, we, we can call down fire, but Jesus did not look at the opposition like this. Jesus loved the people of Samaria, and his mission, not that Elijah and the other prophets didn't love the people, but they had a different kind of mission. Jesus' mission was mercy. He was going to die for the people. He was going to pray for his persecutors. And so he, he says to, to the disciples, you guys don't know what kind of spirit is in you. It's causing you to think like this. The Son of Man came to seek and to save, to, to save the lost, not to destroy them. I've got a different kind of mission. Right? So there's a difference here we see in Jesus and the disciples. They're still learning. Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem out of love, because he loved you. The disciples didn't love the opposition, and they saw them as opposition. What do we learn from that? What, what, what do we need to do? Because there's a lot of opposition towards Christians today, especially biblical Christians. Right? 
Christians that are wanting to hold the Bible as their authority, there's a lot of opposition today. We, we live in a hostile country towards Christians. And some of that's deserved, some of that is undeserved. Let me offer a few suggestions. First thing that we ought to do in the light of uh, opposition is to, we got a next slide, yeah. uh, pray for those who oppose Christ. Pray for those who oppose Christ. Pray for our enemies, we're commanded to in the Bible. Because they're not the enemy, right? It's the one who is behind them, the one who has blinded their eyes to the truth. If God can change hearts, if we are not praying for the opposition in this world, if we're not praying for those who are opposed to Christ and opposed to us, we are failing. We're not going to succeed. It's going to start so that we develop a love for them. Second thing, we need to expect rejection. I think the church has kind of forgotten this. We don't, we don't expect rejection anymore. Uh, we're, we try to appease people, right? Oh, they don't, they don't like us. They're, they're upset with what we're saying. or They're upset with the message that we're giving from the Bible, the truth that we're saying. Oh, how can we water this down so that they feel better, so that we can appease them? We are not called to appease. Jesus said, if they rejected me, they reje they're going to reject you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Expect it. We cannot, as a church, water down the truth. It's God's word, not our word. Right? We don't have the right to change it. And churches are doing this too often. Christians are doing this too often. Because we, we want the world to like us. And not say bad things. But they're not going to like us. That's what we're told. So expect it. But that doesn't mean that we should be a jerk about it, you know? Because sometimes we do get, we're, it's, we're des we deserve some of the persecution sometimes because Christians, we can sometimes act like jerks. We say we love the sinner, but we hate the sin, but we act like we hate them both, right? The way that we talk. And what we do. So don't be a jerk about it, but... Uh, expect there's going to be some opposition. Just make sure that they're opposing the gospel and not your way of delivering the gospel because you're just not being nice about it. Right? Uh, and then another point is view, view people as people, not projects. Right? Well, we feel like we, we can, I got to evangelize, I, I got to win this soul or win that soul. And we, we look at people. Not as people, as souls that are lost, that need Jesus, but we look at them as projects. We need to make sure that love and grace are heard and felt first. Do people hear the message of love and grace first? <coughs> Jesus came to Jerusalem and he turned tables, but that was turning the table on the, the religious <coughs> that were being hypocritical, that were not leading people to Christ. We need to confront those on the outside of the church differently than those on the inside of the church. Jesus, for those who understood that they were sinners, Jesus gave them grace. He gave to the religious leaders who were proud and didn't understand the fact that they were sinners in need of a savior themselves, he gave them the law. The law to the proud grace to the humble. The law was there to humble us so we, they recognize that we need a Savior. Grace to the humble. You watch when Jesus' messages, when they're harsh, when they're the law pounding on them, that is to the religious who think that they've got it all together. But to those who, like the, the woman caught in adultery, it's grace. Love. Make sure that love and grace is heard and felt first. Because we, we, we live in a lost and hurting world. And last, pray to love them like Jesus does. Pray that God change my heart that I see people as people. Change my heart, God, that I can love 
them the way that you love them, that I can see them the way that you see them. The disciples saw them as opposition. They were in the way. They were a force to be dealt with. They were, they were a force to be consumed by fire. But Jesus saw them as people who needed a Savior. How do we see them? We need to be praying that God changes our heart. That God helps us to see people that way all the time. It's a constant, constant battle of humbling ourselves and seeing people the way that Jesus sees them. And then we go from this to the follow me and the cost of discipleship part of this. But this is the setting for Jesus' warning. All right, love. Love. Loving opposition. That's the setting for this call for discipleship. It says, the, the first person that comes to Jesus and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. It's a great claim. And Jesus said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What's he saying? You've got to count the cost. Do you even know what it means? What, do you know what you're saying when you say, I'm going to follow you? When people pray a prayer to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, are you counting the cost? What does that mean? Because to be saved, that means that Jesus needs to be your Lord and your Savior. Not just your Savior, but your Lord. Which means that He is the ruler of your life. And are you surrendering your life to Him? Whatever He calls you to do, you're signing up. I'm going to do it. If you count on the cost of what that means, we make it too easy sometimes, tugging on people's heartstrings, pulling them to receive Jesus. And it's just... You know, make, make nice music so that we get emotional. And say, now come to Jesus, right? He'll save you of your sins. And that's true. But you've got to make him the Lord of your life. You're not saved if he's not the Lord and the Savior, the Lord and the forgiver, the leader of your life. And Jesus says that. This guy says, I'll follow you wherever you want to go. If somebody said that, I'll follow Jesus, we'd be like, yes, great. Let's, let's pray. Let's do this. Amen. And Jesus says, you know, I'll follow you. And he, and he, and he says, hey, do you even know what you're saying? Because you're not going to have anywhere to lay your head. It's going to be hard. Can you do that? Jesus didn't say, oh, someone wants to follow me? Wonderful. Great. More. Check another one off. Blah, blah. We, we, we get excited if somebody says, yeah, I want to know the Lord. And it's great. What does it mean? Do we, do we really help them to count the cost of what that means? So the first thing we've got to do with, with is, is saying is that following Jesus demands counting the cost. And then another guy, Jesus says, follow me. And this, this person said, but Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Now, this sounds really harsh. First, let me go and bury my father. And he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. Ouch. Jesus, that's, that's, that's rough. Right? Says, uh, but you go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. What was Jesus telling him? He said, you got to set your priorities. It doesn't mean that, you know, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you cannot plan your parents' funeral. That's not what Jesus is saying here. But in this case, I mean, we, we look at the, what, what's happening right then, who he's talking to, following Jesus, and then literally walking with him and going on the way to Jerusalem. <laughs> Jesus, he's on his, mo on his mission. He's set his face towards Jerusalem. There's no, you know, saying, oh, i, I got to do this first. No, it's either you're going to follow Jesus or you're not going to follow Jesus. you got to set your priorities. What's your priority? And when Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead, he's talking about the spiritually dead, the people that have chosen not to follow Jesus. They don't, they don't take care of their own. It'll work out. Your, your dad will get buried. Most likely, most, com most commentators don't think that this guy's father was actually dead. And like the funeral is in, you know, the next day. And so I better go, I just, he's laying there. His, his body is there and I got to put it in the ground. And Jesus said, no, come on. 
his father's probably still alive, and he's like, wait, I, 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 it's my job, and so I can't leave and follow you because my dad's still alive. And I gotta be there as a son for the time that he dies to bury him. Jesus is saying, what's your priorities? We need to set our priorities. If God calls you to do something, do it. The, the missionaries of old, you know, back when they, before they, they had the planes, they would get on a boat, like if they were called to Africa, husbands would leave their families. I don't necessarily think this was the best idea or not, but they, they had such a calling and a passion for the lost in Africa, and nobody was there, that they would leave their wife and their children, they would put their belongings into a wood coffin, and put, because they knew they were going to die in Africa because from the malaria or, or whatever. And they, they went to Africa with their casket. They set their face toward Jerusalem. They, they had priorities. You can argue whether they're the right priorities or not, but they were the priorities. Do we set priorities? In our life, say, okay, Jesus is calling me to do this, and I'm going to set that as my priority. I'm going to follow him. The third guy also makes a bolt saying, I'm going to follow you. And uh, he says, but first, permit me to say goodbye to those at home. And Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand in the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you start plowing and you're looking back, you're not going to plow straight lines. You, you, you got to look forward. You got to look ahead. Right? And so he says, we got to have a kingdom focus. You got to be focused on the kingdom of God. Don't look back and regret and say, oh, but I, I love this world. You know? Yeah, I want to follow you, Jesus, but I don't want to give up these things. Oh, man, I miss, I miss that lifestyle. Oh, yeah, I miss those aspects of that. I, I, if you're going to follow Jesus, follow Jesus. Go all out. Set your priorities. Count the cost and say, I'm in and I'm doing it and I'm going forward and I'm not looking back. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We can't keep looking back at the old and wishing for the old or we're not going to enjoy the new. We can't live with our feet in both worlds. The Christian world in the secular world and try and be happy. Those people are lukewarm and they're not ever going to be happy. And some Christians are some of the most miserable people because they're not focused ahead on the kingdom. They're trying to live in both worlds and they have not denied themselves and given up this world. They're trying to, to, try to hold on to what they like from both. It's a miserable place to be. Be hot or cold. Choose one or the other. And what does that look like to count the costs? Uh, to, 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 to face persecution that Jesus was doing? You know, think. I follow Jesus. It's going to be hard. It's going to be different. Uh, Clyde, Joseph, and I went to the prison in Marion this week. This is Clyde's second time. He felt, felt like God calling him this last month do prison ministry, and, and he told me about it last Sunday, and I said, hey, next time you go, I'd like to go. I've, I've only been to a prison one time to do prison ministry in Russia, never done it in the United States, so I wanted to see kind of what, what, what it looked like, what it was about. And we went, last time, he went, he had three guys that were just engaged, and he spent two hours with them, and it's really interesting. This time we went, they were all, they were sleeping, they didn't want to get out of bed, they didn't want to talk. And I, Persecution. I mean, it's light persecution, but it doesn't feel good to be rejected. And uh, but we ended up, you know, we stayed there and we're praying for each other and praying for what's going on. Uh, then Clyde was able to talk to one guy for a good, a good amount of time, and we gave Bibles. And then I talked to another guy who just gotten in uh, prison. Uh, we'll say battleship, and uh, just you know, spent time with him, loving him. If you're interested in, in that kind of ministry, guys, <coughs> girls, a little different, but guys, talk to Clyde, and he's going to be going there 
pretty regularly. And if you'd like to be on that uh, rotation, even if it's not going every week, talk to them. And, and ladies, uh, there are some ladies a few weeks ago that told me, hey, God's been putting this on my heart to prison ministry. If God's putting that on your heart, uh, talk to Debbie Oki. She's one of the ladies that uh, is feeling led towards that. And so uh, find, find her, find me if you don't know who that is, and, and I'll, I'll point you to those people. Say, ah, I'm really interested in that. Or there's a comment card in the back. Put, put that on a prison ministry. And I'll get you connected to, to whoever you need to get connected to. I face a little persecution. I mean, it's, it's hard. You know, we don't face a lot of persecution. It's getting worse in our society. But uh, back in the day, high school, I didn't go to many parties. And, you know, because I went to a secular school that was very secular. It feels like Hillsborough High School feels like a Christian school, I tell you. Christian private school uh, compared to what I went to. And it was a secular school and very secular. But my twin brother and I, we were known for our faith. People knew that Josh and Jeremy, they're the Christian guys. We started a Christian club on campus and these kind of things with a, with a few others. But there was just a handful of us there. They really stood up for our faith. So we didn't get invited to a lot of, a lot of parties, and we didn't really want to go anyways. And so there's, you know, some persecution in that, a feeling of rejection. And I remember our senior year, we decided... Let's, let's go. It's our senior year. We should go to one of these parties, you know, and just to connect with people there. And so we park at the end of the street. There's probably a lot, I mean, a lot of people at this party. We, we parked at the end of the street. We're walking up the street, and there were some of our friends that were in the back of their, they, they were standing at the trunk of their car, drinking beers out of the, out of the trunk. And they saw him. They said, oh, my gosh, the Matlocks. They slammed the trunk down. They ran into the house. And they were probably warning everybody, Matlock's put it away. And uh, they, you know, we, we, it was uncomfortable being there because you know that everybody wasn't easy uh, with, with us being there. You know, it's little, that's a little persecution. Our, that was 20, you know, some odd years ago. Our side is getting way worse. We're experiencing persecution like never before as Christians. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to love the people? Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem for you. Will you set your face toward Jerusalem for others? Are you willing to do that? You know, counting the costs, the, 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 these phrases by Jesus seem so harsh. You know, it's like, oh, Christianity means I've got to count my costs. I've got to have these kingdom priorities. And I've got to... love people like Jesus did, it's not a cost to give up things in this life. If we understand eternity, that there are people that are going to spend eternity in heaven or hell, there are going to be people that are not going to know Jesus and will spend forever without him. That should motivate us out of love, do we love those people enough to face Jerusalem? To give up things of this world that don't matter? Or are we living for this world? 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For Christ's love compels us. I love this verse. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. If we are convinced that Jesus died on the cross. And the only way to salvation, the only way to eternal life is through Jesus. And that there are people that will spend eternity in hell not knowing that relationship with their maker. Then how does that love not compel us to give up everything and follow him? How can we live an ordinary life? How do we live for ourselves if that is truth, if that is the reality? But maybe you're not convinced of that. If your life is living for yourselves, then maybe you're not convinced of this truth. Because Paul said the love of Christ compels us. We're out of control. We can't not do this. Because 
Christ's love is driving us. We are motivated. We're stirred. We're, we're controlled by him. How can we live any other way? I want to invite the, the choir to come up. We're gonna, they're going to close us with a song about God's love. If you don't know God's love, if you don't know what it means to have given your life to him, to surrender everything to him, to make him the Lord and the forgiver of your life, I'd love to talk to you today. Listen to this song. Listen to God's love for us, how deep his love is. And give your life to him today. A couple next steps. You know, if you don't know where to begin, if you're a Christian, you're feeling the challenge, yeah, I got to do more. First thing that you need to do, just start praying that Christ's love will compel you. Just start. It starts with prayer. Just start praying. You can't do anything more important than the first step. Focus on Jesus' death that saves you. And it's the only way that others can be saved. And we've got a class coming up this Wednesday. If you feel stirred, like, yeah, I, I really ought to be sharing my faith more. But I don't know. I want to share my faith more. Not out of, even out of obligation, but, yeah, I'm being compelled to do it. But, you know, I, I, I'm shy. I'm no Billy Graham. I, I can't do that. I encourage you to come out Wednesday night in room 304 over here. It's a free class it's called Becoming a Contagious Christian. It will help you to learn how to share the gospel in your style. In a way that, that fits you. So it's not unnatural, but it, it comes out naturally. So uh, just come on out after the meal on Wednesday night and go to 304. And we'll be, we'll be studying that for five weeks.